So, my name is Rajiv Behija. I'm the co-director of the Development Research Institute um, alongside uh, Billy Stille and Yao Nyarko. Uh, I'm a professor of public policy and economics here at NYU. Uh, welcome to our uh, distinguished panel. I just want to say a couple of words of introduction uh, for those of you who don't know the Development Research Institute. Um, our mission is to bring together um, uh, thought leaders, practitioners at the frontier of uh, issues of development, human well-being, human welfare, uh, and we've been doing this for, for many, many years. So, you know, we, we have uh, organized a series of programs and conferences and, and really dialogues and engagements on a broad range of topics. And so in some ways what we're doing here today is what we've always done, but in other ways, in fact, it is something very new, and so that is why it's a pleasure to get a chance to, um, to introduce this event. Uh, so, um, Madeline uh, uh, Antonsich uh, is a new senior fellow here at the Development Research Institute. Uh, and when she and I began speaking, it really was uh, with the chance to think about issues like the Sustainable Development Goals, um, Sustainable Growth, uh, Decarbonization, and in the way that the Development Institute has, bringing together uh, theory, practitioners, uh, and always asking what is the role for the collaboration uh, between the private sector and the public sector in new and innovative ways. And today's panel uh, is very much uh, part of that. Uh, a lot can be said of Madeline, and I'm only going to say a little bit, um, but I will just say uh, that uh, you know, she was a former vice president and treasurer of the World Bank, um, most recently a senior advisor to UNCTAD on ESG and SDG reporting, uh, and CEO of SASB. Um, she has worked uh, as an economist at the Federal Reserve, uh, but also in the private sector, Goldman Sachs, Barclays, uh, Lehman Brothers, Principal Global, Investors, and others. So I'm really adding an ellipsis there. Uh, her career has been distinguished, um, and so we're very pleased that she is uh, our thought partner and working with us on these sets of issues. Uh, she's also, um, last but not least, an alumna of uh, New York University with a PhD in economics from, from Stern. Uh, the last two things I would like to say, uh, and one is to apologize for the lack of my own presence. I teach a doctoral seminar, which began two minutes ago, so I'm going to uh, leave in just a minute. Uh, but I also wanted to thank uh, our volunteers and staff at the Development Research Institute, uh, Andrea Papito, who's worked tirelessly uh, to make sure uh, that this event occurs, uh, but also Julia Woods, Phil Wee, uh, Susan Olapade, Carmen Vargas, uh, Alida Baumgartner. So thanks to all of them uh, for making this happen. And uh, with that, I'm pleased to turn the floor over to Madeline. And so thank you, and thanks to all of you for being here today. OK, well, thank you very much, Rajiv. So good morning, everybody. And good afternoon and good evening for those of you in different time zones and uh, joining us here on our webinar. And so uh, thank you, all of you in the audience, for joining us. And um, thank you all very much on the panel for doing this. I really appreciate it. It's very generous of you to take your time, especially during UN week. So thank you so much for this. So this morning, we're going to begin with a panel of experts here to my left. And we're going to discuss climate markets and mechanisms that can help achieve our climate targets. So in the middle here, we have Annette Nazareth. Annette is a former SEC commissioner. And she is currently senior counsel at Davis Polk. But importantly for this discussion, she's the chair of the Integrity Council for the Voluntary Carbon Market. Immediately to my left, we have Bob Litterman. He's the partner and chairman of the Risk Committee of Keepers Capital. And also, somewhat important for this conversation, he's on many uh, foundations and um, boards of uh, environmental types of organizations. But he's also the chair of the CFTC, Climate Related Market Risk Subcommittee. And then to my far left, we have Nicholas Godek, who is the head of fixed income tradables at S&P Indices. So we have a lot to discuss. So I'm going to let you read their impressive bios in the event uh, link, which you all have. So let's start with the economics of carbon pricing. And Bob, I'd like to start with you, if that's OK. So most economists would agree that carbon pricing, whether it's through carbon tax or cap and trade, is the most efficient way to slow climate change. Yet, according to the World Bank, only 27 countries have carbon tax rates. And of those countries, in 75% of them, the rate is under $50 per metric ton. Only nine countries have a national emissions trading system. 
And in more than half of those countries, the price of carbon is under is fifty dollars plus or minus a ton. So now I've read some research. You were kind enough to send me research that shows that the price should be maybe in the neighborhood of one hundred eighty-five dollars. I saw a, um, a survey from uh, Reuters of the Economist that indicates it should be around hundred dollars. I saw another research piece that showed that it should be around three thousand dollars. So I, I, I take away two things from that. Number one, the prices are all over the place. And number two, um, clearly $50 is not the right price, too low. So can you first start by talking about defining the social cost of carbon and tell us why is this concept important? Thank you, Madeline. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, the social cost of carbon, it's a terrible name, but the economists came up with it you know, probably three decades ago. Uh, and it, it references the expected damages that an additional ton of carbon will create when emitted into the atmosphere. And it's an externality, that's what economists call it, when you have uh, an effect of some economic activity that's not priced in. The damages created by carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere are not priced in. Of course, years ago, those damages were seen as being far off into the future and very, very small. I think the first economist to address this was a current Nobel Prize winner, Bill Nordhaus, and uh, I think his original estimate was maybe $2 a ton. And uh, one of the things he also uh, indicated is that the price would rise slowly over time, basically at the rate of interest. And so a lot of economists, I think, looking at that, uh, certainly myself, thought, well, uh, that sounds like a problem off, way off in the future. I won't, you know, if we don't get it right this year, we'll catch up. Yeah. Um, but years later, I became kind of interested in this. I became a risk manager on Wall Street, and I kind of was thinking about climate change in the back of my mind during those times, and I thought, that seems like a risk management problem. And uh, indeed, as an economist, you think we have a risk management problem, it's an externality that's not priced, it's obvious what needs to be done. We need to price it, right? And, uh, uh, I, I like to use the word incentives because it's a little bit less, uh, you know, some, people don't react to it as much as saying a tax or a price, but these are all saying the same thing. We have, we have a problem where there's too much pollution going into the atmosphere. We have to create incentives to reduce that uh, pollution. And the uh, social cost of carbon is an attempt by economists to tell us where that price should be. If the damage is $2 a ton, we should charge $2 a ton when people emit carbon dioxide. Now, as you mentioned, the Resources for the Future, which is probably the leading economic uh, research institute on climate and environment, recently released a paper where they've estimated it at $185. I've, I've heard separately uh, that the US government may come out with a $200 price. Uh, those numbers, by the way, seem reasonable to me. I actually wrote a paper published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences a couple of years ago on this, we just said we can't get a price, uh, I had co-authors, Kent Daniel and Bernard Wagner, we said we can't get a price below $120 a ton. We could easily go up. We showed all the different indicators that you could bring in that would cause the price to go up. If you push them to the lowest reasonable level, you still get over $100 a ton. So I think it's a, it's a very significant incentive is required. We need to decarbonize the, the world quickly. One of the things as a risk manager you recognize is that time is a scarce resource. If we have enough time, we can solve any problem. It's when we run out of time. And I've seen this several times in my career on Wall Street. You think you've got enough time to get out of a position. You, know, you remember the London whale? That's, you know, you, all of a sudden you can't get out because you know, that, that's a little bit of a different issue, but here with respect to climate, we don't know how much time we have. And there are potential, uh, you could call them tipping points, points after which catastrophic outcomes become inevitable. In fact, I was just up in Greenland uh, about a month ago, and it's very likely that the entire Greenland ice sheet is gonna melt. The oceans have so much heat, and they melt the ice from underneath that would be at least 20 feet of sea level rise. And it's really a question of when. So I'm changing my tune. I'm no longer saying we don't know when we're going to cross a catastrophic tipping point. We already have, and probably others that we just don't even know about. So uh, it's, a, it's a very serious and urgent problem. 
And the essence of the problem today is that we're not price entirely. We have this limited budget, it's very limited, of additional CO2 we can put into the atmosphere, uh, maybe 10 years worth at current rates of depleting it. And yet, the world is actually increasing its emissions right now. And the average global incentive, you mentioned all these different places where there are carbon prices, the average price is uh, globally in the teens. Now, there's a lot of dispersion, which is kind of interesting. Europe has very strong incentives to reduce emissions. Europe is much more carbon efficient than the rest of the world. Um, the, uh, the rest of the world and the US is part of a big block of economies that essentially have very little incentive to reduce emissions. And then there's other countries uh, in the Middle East, uh, in Venezuela, in the uh, Soviet Union, where they're actually subsidizing uh, fossil fuel use. And so these incentives are all across the board. We need to get them to the right level, and that's essentially uh, the problem from an economic perspective. Now, a lot of people don't think we're ever going to get there. One of the reasons I'm very interested in carbon markets, and especially uh, natural climate solutions, is those are very inexpensive ways to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere, and that's certainly where we should be starting. So, and also, these natural climate solutions are global. So if we can create a trading regime of natural climate solutions funding uh, the movement of money from developed countries into developing countries where they can build carbon into natural sinks in forests and so on, uh, you know, that will be a direction toward a globally harmonious appropriate that, price on carbon. That's one of the reasons I've got Annette here, but before we go there, and, and you're 100% correct, and I think one of the issues too is I don't think enough people understand uh, or make that proper link in terms of the economics because one of the things that that I've observed when I, you know, in the ESG reporting spaces, there's no economist that's involved in, 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 in establishing any of this, which of course, you know, economics is the study of an allocation of scarce resources and nothing is more scarce than, you know, the environment. And that's one of the things that I'm working on uh, here at the Institute, coming up with sort of more economics-based um, indicators for reporting. But before we go there, um, so I looked at some of the recent market prices of these, you know, I just mentioned how many countries and so on from the uh, World Bank data. And um, so I looked at the market prices and tax rates across these countries. Now, um, obviously, since there's only nine countries that even have a market, um, not that many have both mechanisms. But of those that have both mechanisms, there's dramatic price differences. So take, for example, in the UK, carbon is trading four times higher than its, than its uh, tax rate. So the carbon price is around $99 currently, and the tax rate is 24%. On the other hand, in Switzerland, carbon is trading half the price of its tax. So the, the carbon is trading at 64, and Switzerland is among the highest tax rates, 130. The highest tax rate is 137, um, which is uh, Uruguay. Canada is the only country where they're, they're equal, $40, which is a very, very low. So can you comment, um, how can a country incentivize companies to change their behavior to reduce uh, emissions, which is the whole purpose of a tax, for example, um, sufficiently enough, given that we have such significant differences in pricing, even within a country, in the different two mechanisms? So how, do we incent how does a country incentivize companies? Okay, well. Uh, you know, I would say that this is one of those things where you can take a glass half full or a glass half empty. On the positive side, yeah. most of the big companies uh, around the globe, not just in the U.S., but around the globe, have now recognized the danger from climate change, have promised to become net zero by some date, some sooner than others, but typically by 2050, and are putting in plans for achieving that. Okay, uh, and, and not only their shareholders, but also their employees, uh, their customers, you know, all of the stakeholders are now very much aligned about this is what we ought to do. The problem is that when you're in business, you have to make a profit. And ultimately, that's what these businesses are trying to do. And if they say, well, I could, you know, do this uh, low carbon approach, but my competitor is not, I'm going to lose business. And that's ultimately what's preventing 
companies for moving forward. So what they need is a as a regulatory you know environment and a government policy that will allow them to move in the direction they want to go and not be competitively disadvantaged by that. I would say that's where we have to get to. So uh, thank you for that. So Annette, um, um, Bob was just talking about some of these incentives and you know sort of the reverse of emissions. And so that's a, uh, a good segue into a conversation with you. And um, so would you tell us about the voluntary carbon market? Can you tell us what it is, how it works, how is that going to drive climate mitigation? Sure, well thank you for inviting me to speak here and with such uh, knowledgeable people in this area. Um, the voluntary carbon market has existed for many years, um, but has uh, delivered some good results, but some mixed results. So um, emphasis on voluntary, it's not regulated. Um, it has enormous potential in my view, partly because of what Bob said, governments have not acted quickly enough and uh, in a, any sort of concerted way. And so there's an enormous potential for the private sector to play a very key role here. But to do that, we need standards and we need high quality, high integrity standards that are sort of universally accepted. And that is the role of the Integrity Council for the Voluntary Carbon Market that I chair because what we see is the potential for the voluntary carbon market to very meaningfully accelerate the transition to 1.5, if 1.5 is even achievable at this point. But we have to use every tool in the toolbox. And the tool here is to basically use the capital markets as a way of accelerating the transition. And we do that by having projects such as the ones that Bob talked about, like nature-based solutions, projects where companies can invest in projects that are very high integrity. Often those projects are in the global south, so they have other benefits of bringing development money to the global south and benefiting indigenous people and local communities, but also more important, equally important, I shouldn't say more importantly, but equally important, um, reducing reducing, removing, avoiding, you know, the carbon emissions that um, that we have today. And there really is a potential, I believe, to um, to increase the size of that market, you know, 25 to 50 times at least over the next decades. But again, to do that, we need to um, to have buy-in on on these principles that we're developing. So core carbon principles that will uh, set what the sort of commonly understood standard is for a high quality carbon credit. And, um, you know, what we have today, and the reason the market has not been successful today, is that we don't have standardization. We don't have sort of uniform confidence in the market. Uh, it's very much a bilateral market, very opaque. So we, we all know, you know, what it takes to have a good, successful capital market. That's not what we have today. What we have today are some very good projects, some very good programs that uh, have been developed, but there's no consistency. So we have some excellent projects. We have some greenwashing. And you know, Bob talked about corporates that are very interested in being part of the solution. Obviously, some of them, it's their leadership. Others, it's they're getting pressure from shareholders. But they, you know, they also have a fiduciary duty and their duty is to ensure that their corporate assets are invested in projects that are real and verifiable. And today that's very difficult to do. Um, you know, these bilateral contracts really require a lot of due diligence. You have to hire climate scientists to help you interpret, um, you know, what, whether this is a good project or not. There aren't enough climate scientists in the world to do that. So, you can't scale up a market to the levels that we have the potential to do with the current market structure. So that's where I came in as a former regulator and a former markets regulator, uh, because before I was a commissioner, I ran the division of trading and markets. So I like to say that I understand markets. This asset class is a little new to me, but it's also existential. So it's a, a real privilege to be able to work on these issues.
Great. Thank you for that. You know, um, I think we're going to probably see um, this take off a little bit more um, with the taxonomy, the EU taxonomy. And I don't want to go into a big conversation on that because that's a huge conversation. And I'm going to also touch on that in the um, fireside chat. But um, uh, just very quickly, you know, um, in order to qualify for funding in the future in EU, there are these, you know, criteria that have to be um, maintained. And there are these so-called uh, performance thresholds. And on the top of that, you have to a, a somebody that wants to invest and in, you know get funding um, has to make a substantial contribution to one of the six um, important um, environmental objectives. And right now, the only one that's like top of the list is mitigation. And so climate mitigation, which is really what you're all about, is the top priority. And so I think you know EU is very much ahead of certainly any place else, certainly the US. And so I think that may help um, support companies doing more of this. So uh, you, you touched a little bit about um, the potential of the voluntary carbon market being able to generate hundreds of billions, as, as now the numbers are being uh, tossed about, of uh, additional climate finance um, by 2050, a long time from now, but hopefully we can achieve that. And you mentioned that a lot of this could go into developing economies, which would be fantastic, because 90%, as you mentioned, of the natural climate solutions are in the global south. Um, so right now, the market's less than $2 billion. Of course, it's, an, it's a new market. So what do you think needs to be done to help you know, uh, continue to generate this? I guess it's the, uh, the core. The yes, core. We're, we're developing what we call core carbon principles, yep. which will define what a high-quality carbon credit is. Um, and we will, so we will have these standards, and then we will have an assessment framework mm -hmm. to ensure that those standards are being applied so that when a program is approved and it is, they, you know, a program says that it satisfies the CCPs, that it actually does. Um, and I think that will have a really profound effect on the market because now you'll have standardization, you'll have, um, you know, much more seamless trading. It will certainly lead to greater confidence. I think ultimately uh, the pricing should improve if this works well. First of all, because there should be a flight to the high quality projects. Uh, I think we'll also uh, see a lot more futures trading on these, on these products. Uh, so now we'll also be able to have hedging in these products in ways that we don't have as seamlessly today. Um, and I think that will also send an important price signal. So I would assume that the pricing will increase. And that has a, a number of benefits, obviously, uh, including that um, uh, on the where we really want to do is obviously to reduce our emissions to the full extent possible, become more economic to reduce one's emissions rather than to simply invest in, in uh, carbon credits. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as, as you know, uh, carbon credits are intended to be really a complementary tool. First and foremost, we have to get our emissions down right, to the full extent possible. So these credits are designed to accelerate the transition by saying, we're going to get our emissions down as much as possible, but there's a limit to what we can do today. And to get to that last mile, if we invest in carbon credits so that the money goes into these projects, we will again, accelerate the ability to, um, to get to net zero hopefully right. by 2050. Thank you. So um, two things. Can you tell us how these uh, CCPs differ from existing standards? Um, and also, so now you're the Integrity Council, but there's also a, an Integrity Initiative. Mm -hmm. So you're the Integrity Council of the Voluntary Carpet Market. There's a Voluntary Carpet Market Integrity Initiative. Right. How do you guys um, overlap or work together? So tell me again your first question. So what? the first question, I'm <laughs> sorry, is um, uh, basically tell us how the CCPs differ from um, other right. standards. Right. And, and excuse me one second. The, and the issue that I worry about is we don't want a, because time is of the essence, right. we don't want yet another ESG environment and right. the reporting space where we have so many competing right. Um, you know, standards right. that investors have just thrown up their arms and saying, forget it, we're not even going to look at this stuff, right? right. So, so what do we do to make sure we don't have that repeat? And how do, how do you always differ? Well, what we're trying to do is to take the best that is out there today. Yeah. And uh, the core carbon principles have been developed uh, with the assistance of 
12 internationally recognized climate experts. And they are, again, taking sort of the best of what's out there. And um, so we have proposed the CCPs, the, the core carbon principles, they're out for public consultation. Um, our hope is that we can take sort of the best of what we have now, but we're ambitious. We have to be both ambitious and pragmatic. And that's tricky, right? Because we are insistent that we have to have high quality. We sh if we don't have high integrity, the markets should not scale because it's, we're not going to improve uh, the world as, as we have it now. So it has to be ambitious, but doable. And so I think what we'll do is we'll start with on a, with a standard, because everybody doesn't apply the same standards today. Start with sort of a threshold standard of what a high quality carbon credit should be today with a clear pathway to increasing our ambition, taking into account both what could be done today but isn't being done, so you need to develop those uh, additional standards plus what climate science might permit in the future. So. Um, it's really an accreting process, but we're, we're very excited about that. Now, your other question on sort of what, what's our role versus VCMI, a lot of people ask that. Um, the Integrity Council for the Voluntary Carbon Market is really focused on the supply of credits. So what, what does it mean to be a high quality carbon credit? And we're also focused on the market's mechanisms. So we're, we're gonna focus on how do these things trade, how do they trade on exchanges? How do, they, how do you have a futures market? Um, what would the trade reporting look like? Transparency, things of that nature. Our sister organization, VCMI, which is the Voluntary Carbon Market Integrity Initiative, is focused on what we call the demand side. How are credits appropriately used? And that goes back to the, and, uh, what I said earlier, which is that first and foremost, we all have to have high ambition about reducing our emissions. You can't just buy your way out um, by purchasing credits. So VCMI is focused on that sort of waterfall. You know, how do you reduce your emissions, and then when you, you, you know, when can you legitimately use a credit after you have shown that you've reduced, you've made every effort to reduce your emissions to the extent possible. Great. Thank you very much. That makes a lot of sense. So now you mentioned um, liquidity and futures and so on. So that's why we have. Nick here. So, um, so Nick, uh, we're going to turn to trading. So, according to Refinitiv, the value of the traded global CO2 permit is just under $1 trillion. And about 90% of that is in EU, as you'd expect, because they've got the, you know, the biggest market there, the emissions trading um, system. And that's up 165% over just the past year. And now the EU market has been around since 2000. Five. So you can see all of a sudden this big interest, and I'm sure a lot of that is coming from EU. A lot of that's coming from the EU Green New Deal, which I guess that's going to probably help on, on in your space as well as the taxonomy, as I mentioned. So um, can you talk to us, Nick, about um, how and why the permits market, in addition to this, is, is changing rapidly? And can you also um, talk about the indices? So I understand that there's a, kind of two kinds of indices. One is for the allowances. One is for the offsets. Allowances exchange traded, the offsets is OTC. Can you explain sort of a how their indices are created and um, you know how they're traded, what's the liquidity, and so on? Uh, absolutely, and th thank you, Madeline. It's a pleasure to be here talking with you and everybody in such a distinguished panel. Um, so you're, you're absolutely right in terms of predominant trading taking place in the the EU. I, I think it's important to note that um, the most liquid markets to date have really been focused on the compliance side of the market. That is, um, markets that are enforced through regulatory um, regimes um, and their, their support. And there's been a really robust uh, futures market that's um, developed on the most liquid um, programs. Uh, so, so, however, there was no single point of kind of something to measure the market, no single price. All these contracts trade um, in different regimes. So for example, the EU, an EU allowance is not fungible into kind of the California program or the regional greenhouse gas initiative program or UK, for instance. 
Um, and as you mentioned early on, there's very different prices within all these regimes. So the idea um, which led us to develop an index was to really bring transparency to what a global uh, price of carbon is, given that these aren't really fungible um, programs. And, and so that's really what we, we did, but we focused on um, the most um, liquid, tradable, also markets that are accessible by um, financial intermediaries. So it could be replicated um, by investors because what we were hoping to drive is really further democratization of the market. Traditionally, many of these compliance markets have been restricted to compliance actors. So those firms that are um, greenhouse gas emitters. Um, and with, with futures, that was sort of a step um, towards broadening access and um, enabling ease of trading. And with an index on those uh, futures, or the most liquid futures, um, there's now uh, funds that are, are tracking um, the index that we developed and also other indices in the market. Um, on our global carbon index, there's now $1.2 billion uh, in uh, assets under management. Um, and this is, we launched the index just a couple of years ago. The funds went live fairly recently, also uh, a couple of years ago. So demand has been sharply increasing and now um, it's accessible by more and more people. And the idea is really to support this important market mechanism. Uh, more recently, we've also um, launched a voluntary market index, um, so that we've really been seeing that market develop as well. You mentioned the offsets, so it's true. A lot of it is uh, over-the-counter trading. Um, however, there's been an increasing move towards exchange and really standardization, um, as Annette mentioned. So, for example, one of the more predominant exchanges is the expansive CBL exchange. Um, and certain uh, offset um, spot markets have grown in liquidity that the uh, CME group has actually launched um, last year only futures markets on their global emissions um, offset contracts and their uh, nature-based global emission offset contracts. And those markets only launched um, last year and they're on track for the current year to exceed 1 billion in trading which is really showing high demand coming from not just kind of regulated, um, really forced actors, but also corporations and individuals who are looking to ramp up um, their participation in the space. And as uh, Annette mentioned, really every different mechanism is, is important. And, and to note there, there's also um, the index that we developed is designed to be tradable as well. Um, so there is a, a fund on that too. So with that, uh, there should be broader participation in these markets um, from institutional investors, also retail. All of this adds to the depth of liquidity in these markets and supports these pricing mechanisms. Do you want to say anything on that? Yeah, no, you know, it, um, uh, the comments also made me think about, uh, and also what Bob said earlier and you said about Bob's involvement with the CFTC and all this, um, with their their environmental uh, report. You know, what I find so promising about all this is, although we are voluntary and we don't have regulatory authority, we're very adjacent to regulated markets. Um, I like to say that what we're trying to establish is a regulated light market. Uh, as I said earlier, we wouldn't be doing this if governments had been able to step up more quickly. Uh, so we are obviously um, acting as we are because we think we need to, as a private sector, take the lead. But what we're building is really building on all of the work that's been done in financial markets in the past, and we're not reinventing the wheel. So in terms of transparency and price, price transparency and and oversight and, and uh, you know, all, the whole framework is really based on regulatory principles. And actually, we have been communicating very frequently with IOSCO and with Russ Benham at the CFTC. My thought is that if at any point governments want to step up and take this back, that's okay. We want it to be really modular so they could you know, take it over. The other the other um, issue, though, is that with this increased transparency and given the adjacency 
I think, between the voluntary carbon market and, let's say, the futures market, particularly in the U.S., because we're seeing these futures trading, that, that market is pervasively regulated mm -hmm. by the CFTC. They have, in the cash market, they only have uh, anti-fraud and anti-manipulation authority. But even there, they could be now looking at trade reporting that they have not heretofore seen, right, because it's been a very opaque. So I think having a regulator that's right sort of abutting the cash market and that's looking at this activity is also very, very helpful. And uh, so I wanted to raise that, so because obviously a lot of the work that you know Bob did will actually be very helpful as we move ahead with the voluntary market as well. There's a lot of interaction between the two. Right, and um, do you deal at all with ESMA? Because again, back to my point about the taxonomy, mm -hmm. Europe is really the place where it's all happening and, and it being driven. Right. And um, and so if any if any um, you know a geographic region is going to be really yeah. key to this growth of this market, yeah. especially with the you know the, their first um, you know principle, their first you know objective, the mitigation is key. So right. I'm just wondering, do you deal with ESMA at all? We haven't so much yet. We've gone through IASCO, but I think there's oh, right. a lot of opportunity yeah. Uh, yeah. as we go forward, particularly after we finalize the core carbon principles. Right. So I'm going to come back to those principles in a minute and um, uh, to the uh, consultation process. But while we're still talking, sort of on a measurement kind of um, a level, Bob, can, can I switch to you? And um, so the ESG space, we all know there's lots and lots of issues with measurement, and in particular in the environmental um, space. And so, of course, in the offset space, I can imagine there's going to be issues um, with um, not only the credibility and all the other things that you're working on, and that but also just the measurement. And one, of course, big thing is carbon flux. So can you talk about what is carbon flux and um, you know, tell us about the measurement and how reliable or not it is? Sure. Uh, I think carbon flux is a very fundamental kind of idea. Uh, NOAA, the you know, National Oceanographic Agency, defines it as the flow of carbon dioxide out of uh, the water into the atmosphere. But more generally, you can think of carbon dioxide flowing from the atmosphere into water, into land, and, and so on, and, and out. And so uh, really, when we think about the atmospheric capacity to hold carbon dioxide, that's what we have to focus on. Now, when people talk about carbon accounting, they talk about scope one emissions, scope two emissions, scope three emissions. It's a mess, OK, and particularly scope three. The important thing to recognize is that the carbon flux ultimately is what we care about, and ultimately that's scope one for someone, someone's direct emissions into the atmosphere. Or in the case of the uh, voluntary carbon market, what we're talking about is removing CO2 from the atmosphere. And uh, what we really need, I think, to develop this market is a reference security that represents you know, one ton of removal, permanent removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Because when you emit carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, it's basically a ton permanently out there causing damage. If you want to offset that, what you want is a ton pulled out of the atmosphere uh, permanently. One of the problems with the voluntary carbon market, right, there's a number of issues, measurement issues and metrics that really have to be developed, but one of the problems is what they call permanence. When you pull it, ton of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, let's say into a forest, well, it's not going to be there permanently, or it's most likely going to be emitted back into the atmosphere at some point, maybe through natural causes, maybe because of forest fires, or maybe because of uh, logging or whatever. Uh, so these are, so permanence is one issue. There are other issues that we can talk about in terms of count, carbon accounting, additionality, is would this have been pulled out anyway? Leakage, if I prevent this from being cut down, does some other force somewhere else uh, get cut down? And then uh, double counting. Mm -hmm. One of the really tough questions in this market is who's providing the oversight of, you know, the regulatory oversight because it's a global market and, you know, how do we make that comparable? And then who gets to decide what's additional within this country or whatever. And so we, we really need to develop uh, these uh, global metrics. Now, I was just uh, at an event earlier today from the Woodwell Climate Research Center. I'm, I'm on their board. 
and they're developing these metrics, science-based metrics. You can now basically on a plot of land, it's, it, these days it's you know bigger than a football field, but it's getting smaller and smaller, uh, measure the carbon content. So if you can measure the carbon content today and next year, you can measure the carbon flux into that. And similarly with other types of uh, uh, carbon removals, what we really need are, are good metrics that have integrity, are these real carbon reductions. And that's what corporations want. They want to be able to say, all right, as part of net zero, I've emitted these many tons, I'm going to remove those many tons. And right now, they're very averse to doing that because they're afraid they're going to be accused of greenwashing or even sued over fraud and things like that. So uh, this market definitely needs to develop. But I would say we know how to do that. I mean, the, the, the financial markets created tremendous liquidity in mortgages, okay? and now. We can talk about it. that had some problems too, and we don't want to blow up the world over this. But basically, every mortgage is backed by a property that has you know a lot of idiosyncratic uh, characteristics. Similarly, these carbon projects are very idiosyncratic, but we know how to create instruments and securities and insurance and regulatory structures that will allow this market to expand. And there's a lot of folks in that myself who are working to do that. An awful lot of governments around the world now are trying to make this happen. Uh, the regulators are as well. The CFTC just held hearings on this issue a couple of months ago and now is asking for input. So there's a lot of motion moving forward. It's, it's a difficult problem, but I think you know we're making tremendous progress. Yeah, that's uh, very encouraging. I think it's, um, it's um, we're going to have questions pretty soon, but no questions. Okay. So um, we are, uh, I think it's really important if we could somehow marry what, all the stuff that you're working on with all these so called standard service in the ESG space, because, you know, they're out there doing these things, scope one, scope two, driving companies crazy, and, you know, investors are now starting to ignore it. And so somehow we need to get some, you know, some rational um, science base. Um, approach to all of this because right now I can tell you it, it's, it's not which which we really need to sort of figure that problem out. Um, so Annette, can we go back to um, that consultation? So I understand there's a consultation process. You mentioned it. So can you tell us about the process? Uh, who are the stakeholders? Um, how long the comment period is? How can we all you know add comments and so on? Well, thank you for that. Well, uh, hearkening back to my statement that we're trying to do this in the, the most regulated-like way as possible, uh, consistent with international standards. Uh, we have a 60-day comment period on our proposed core carbon principles and our assessment framework and our assessment procedures. Um, the comment period ends on September 27th. Uh, it's not for the faint of heart. Oh, it's okay. very long. <laughs> We've had um, all, upwards of like 50 consultations with uh, various groups who we think have a stake, who really should be commenting so that we could give them sort of a high-level overview, uh, ample warning that they needed to start reading right away because this is not like, I could say this to a group of students, you can't pull an all-nighter on this and write a good paper or write a good <laughs> comment letter. So um, we tried to get, you know, engagement from all the stakeholders, whether it was the carbon crediting programs or Again, the indigenous people and local community groups, lots of lots of different stakeholders, um, and I think that's that's gone quite well. So where uh, the comment period ends on September 27th, and then we'll have quite a bit of um, work to do to uh, to take into account the comments, and uh, we're hoping you know by the end of the year to uh, to have our final uh, you know core carbon principles and assessment framework in place so that. Um, Sooner rather than later, we can really start scaling up the markets based on those those principles. And can you give us any insight to reactions so far, or you know, well, I, the stakeholders? Yeah, I, look, I think you'd expect it. We were very ambitious in the proposal. Um, we thought that high ambition was the approach to take. Um, I think what we are hearing is that you know a lot of very good ideas, maybe some. Um, uh, some way to stage uh, some of these uh, more ambitious proposals, but but certainly, um, I think I've been heartened by the fact that people really understand the need 
for this and uh, really want to, you know, really want to engage, but obviously want it to be not just ambitious but pragmatic. So how are we going to do this? How can we start with sort of the best of what we have today and then build on that and under what time frame? Thank you. So um, you mentioned earlier about assessing projects. So I, I wanted to ask you two things. Firstly, um, when you start assessing the projects um, and by a C, which projects are CCP um, aligned, what's going to be the impact on the market and on climate finance? But also, can you step back and also tell us so exactly who's going to be assessing it and how we can, what's, what's well, the I process? Well, I be clear on that because we're not, uh, the Integrity Council is not going to be in a position to assess individual projects. Correct. We are assessing programs, so the VERAs and the gold standards of the world, um, from uh, both a governance perspective, are they well governed, do they have, you know, conflicts of interest policies, do they have policies and procedures in place to ensure that all of the uh, uh, you know, the programs that they assess, you know, have integrity. Um, there will be separate sort of validators that they hire that look at projects. We will not look at individual projects. We will look, though, at methodologies. So looking at certain kinds of like nature-based solutions, the, the removals, avoidance, those kinds of things, looking for, you know, where are their pain points, where are their, uh, you know, certain types of projects that perhaps would require even more scrutiny or not be included, that kind of thing. So um, that's that's really how we do it. So you almost, in a, some way, have some quasi-regulatory oversight in a way, yes. even though it's voluntary. Yes. And um, so, and it's almost like, not that you give a stamp of approval, but it's some almost like that you would say, okay, these guys qualify, and so they're legit, yes. and so those projects seem to be yes. being done in a proper place. Yes. So we will we will assess programs and methodology types, and they will sort of have our approval. Um, again, because we are not a regulatory body, we don't have enforcement authority. Um, we know how to name and shame. We'll have there'll yeah. be a lot of transparency, and we will have the ability to pull, you know, approvals uh, of of programs and methodologies. So, oh. so there is some. Uh, to that extent, some enforcement authority. But I think, you know, we always said at the SEC, um, you know, that uh, transparency is the great disinfectant. And I think here, when we have dramatically better transparency than we have today, uh, we'll see much, you know, we'll see better practices because there'll be people looking and reporting on each other if, if things aren't being done appropriately. Yeah, this is great. And it's great to see this market continue to evolve. Yeah. Um, because, you know, at the end of the day, it's not just about how much we emit, because it's about, you know, how to uh, pull it back and the mitigation is very, yeah. very, very key. So, um, uh, Bob, you touched on, you know, the carbon accounting. And um, so do you see the voluntary carbon market as a tool for increasing investments in natural capital? Assuming, of course, we address all of these issues that, that you mentioned, you know, the additionality, the research, and so on. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. We see, and you know, I work in an investment firm. The demand today is for investments in solutions and in hedges and in uh, the voluntary carbon market. We even have uh, interested investors. We've we've uh, gone long the futures on the CME and been delivered credits. Well, you know, one of the problems is you get delivered the lowest quality, <laughs> the cheapest to deliver is what you get delivered, and you know. There, there needs to be a maturity of this market because there is a lot of, uh, you know, lower quality credits out there and, uh, and not a lot of information. So we need transparency. We need better, you know, markets, more liquid. By the way, these, these markets are getting more liquid, but they're not very liquid yet. We need a reference security uh, and spreads. Uh, we need, you know, there's a lot of things we need and we know. But yes, we could deliver, uh, you know, huge increases, and we should. The, the economics of this are that the natural climate solutions are the cheapest mm -hmm. real ways to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Sadly, they're, they're limited in scope. As we do them, you know, the, the, the cost will go down, you know, the, the, the availability will go down. The voluntary carbon market could maybe uh, reduce emissions by 10%. You know, that's, that's not enough. We need 
to reduce emissions, our, our emissions have to come down as well as increasing in the size in the voluntary market. And ultimately, we will, of course, need to get to direct air capture. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that's very expensive today. Today, that might be $1,000 a ton, whereas you know, high quality uh, carbon credits are maybe $20 a ton. And then, of course, there's the low quality ones that aren't really very real, but are out there. And uh, so the, the market needs to mature, but when it matures, there could be a tremendous increase in the flow of capital into these investments. And again, it's a way of providing a flow of capital from developed countries to the developing countries. And that's, that's really important. So it does, and it'll also protect the um, biodiversity. There's a lot of co-benefits. It, it helps indigenous peoples, it helps clean water, clean air, biodiversity, pollination, et cetera. So we can talk about the conservation co-benefits and health co-benefits, which are all really key. But to answer your question, yes, there could be a dramatic scaling up once we get these other things sorted out, because economically, this is where the money should be flowing, in the cheapest ways. Yeah, I, I love the idea and the fact that it does flow to the emerging and developing economies. Um, and because, and you know, at the end of the day, what they say and what is true, they're suffering, suffering the consequences of you know what the developed world has done, um, you know, industrialization versus not. And you know, um, I've done a lot of work on, work on catastrophic risk and mitigating the financial impact. Um, with countries. And countries and the developing economies, they are hit more than 10 times higher as, uh, they are hit harder than developed economies, more than 10 times higher as a percent of their GDP than the developed world. So not only are they not getting the benefits of, you know, development with um, the industrialized as we are, but they're suffer suffering the consequences. So this is really a way of transferring not only the money in, but also to help them create some kind of development. So we have a question here, but Annette, did you want to add one more thing? No, I was just going to say that I agree with Bob that you know the, the real opportunities now are on the nature-based solutions. I do think as we go further out, we will see a lot more investment in the, in the technology yeah. solutions. And so that's a very promising part of this market as well. Yeah. And Bob, can I ask you one, one second? I'm sorry, this, this is just in Bob's comment. Um, uh, you said that you get, can you just explain how that all works? Does you get delivered? Now in the financial world, we usually don't want delivery, right? Because right. We just want to keep rolling that future. And so would you explain how that all works? Right, well, I'm, I'm not actually down in the weeds on the delivery process, <laughs> but I know that uh, we have investors who want to invest in this voluntary carbon market, mm -hmm. but are you know worried about all the things that we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. We thought, at, at where I work, Tempos Capital, we have clients who asked us to invest, and we have on their behalf. We just wanted to know what would happen if we take delivery. Right. It was kind of an experiment. I would bet. So we took <laughs> delivery, and we got what we thought, you know. Right. So I'm sorry, you have a question. Yeah. Um, so is it, do we have a, um, a microphone? Give us one second, because we want you know, people on the, um, yeah, thank you very much, Nick. But you can bring it, you can get ready in case it No, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay. Um, so I like, I like to kind of just look at things holistically and, and try to understand how this all kind of goes together, right? So um, as you know, the SEC has been working on the climate disclosure regulations, right? Um, the final version is expected for November. We don't know if there's going to be lawsuits and what's going to happen relative to that. Um, uh, at the end of the day, that comes through, right? That you know we start to see transparency in the markets. At some point in the future, we implement a carbon tax, and the carbon tax then gives us visibility to who the bad actors are, and it gives us visibility to where the most carbon emissions are, right? Um, and so if I'm reporting my scope one, my scope two, and my scope three, and I'm paying a carbon tax on those carbon emissions, right? Um, and technically, uh, under scope three, uh, for the greenhouse gas protocol, it clearly, it clearly calls out, you break scope three into 15 different components, you report on that, you clearly call out what is an offset, you cannot include that 
and, and you, you can't you can't just take your offset and just magically reduce the number of scope one, scope two, scope three. So it's it's just kind of off in a separate category, right? Um, and what I'm thinking about uh, offsets, right? Um, and I'm thinking about purchasing them. Um, I think I guess my question is: Is it is it uh, you're buying it because you know? that right now, in the interim, I'm going to be a bad actor, right? I don't have enough people on my sustainability team. I don't have enough of the systems in place internal to my company. It's going to take a while to do that. I feel bad, right? I feel bad, so in the interim, I'm just going to buy carbon offsets, right? Um, because I, I can't mitigate that, right? I cannot control that. Um, but I still want the public to look at my company in a good way, right? Um, is like, is that what is that what the next five to ten years looks like, right? Can well, I you try look like that. you're ready to answer that. And yeah. That wants to jump into as a regulator. Yeah, I mean, you you describe what's going on today very accurately, and it's a mess, and it's not helping uh, solve the problem. Let's start with the carbon pricing. I hope you're right. I hope we get a carbon tax. At that point, we don't need to worry about scope three emissions. You know, we don't worry about how much ketchup does someone eat, right? Because they paid for it. The reason we measure scope three emissions is because they're not paid for. Once they're paid for, we're now allocating resources as we should, a scarce resource according to price. Okay, so today, the idea of scope three emissions, and I think it's sad, is let's uh, find who's responsible. You know, the, the emissions from the oil companies are coming out of the tailpipes of automobiles. It's not that we don't know how much emissions there are. We know exactly how much CO2 is coming out because we know how much gasoline is produced. The issue is who's responsible? Is it the automotive, is it the driver? Is it the auto company? Is it the oil company? Is it the steel manufacturer that made the steel for the car? Is it the mine that, you know, and you could count those emissions 20 times on the way to the final scope three. By the way, very hard for companies to figure out what the emissions are, the upstream and downstream. Uh, and so I, it's, a, it's an awful lot of work. Uh, and I think a lot of corporations are pushing back on this. It's like, this is going to be, we're going to have to get audited scope three numbers. This is going to be a tremendous amount, and they're not even going to be meaningful. And so uh, there is some pushback on this. And, and I, I think, again, that's what my comment about scope one emissions are. Scope one emissions are the carbon flux into the atmosphere. That's what we need to worry about. We don't need to worry about assigning blame. We need to put a price on it, and then we need to reduce it, and, and eventually, hopefully, pull CO2 out of the atmosphere and get back to an equilibrium. But in the meantime, yeah, it's a terrible mess right now. Well, and, and that gets to the point that, that I made, and, and I have made many times now um, outside of this uh, environment here. Um, there's no economist, and you mentioned about you know, the allocation of scarce resources. There's no economist involved in making any of these ESG rules. And so we've got, now this is kind of snowballed into this, you know, a, a bit out of control um, uh, set of, you know, reporting requirements that, that are meaningless, frankly, because as you point out, you know, scope three has no meaning if you just do it correctly at the, at the source. And so what I find um, troublesome is that, you know, these are, these are standards that are being set without any context. It's just how, how many tons doesn't mean relative to what. There's no context. But and, if, uh, yeah, if I could make a positive comment on yep. there, I think that we are moving quickly. Europe is creating border carbon adjustments. Yes, and but that's it, a tax. Well, yeah. in and of itself, maybe it's not, but it certainly doesn't make sense without a tax. Yes. And so in this country, uh, there is now a move to also, in, in fact, the U.S. is already negotiating with Europe over certain mm -hmm. border carbon adjustments, yeah. and there's a movement to create those border carbon adjustments. The nice thing about that is the Republicans love it, mm -hmm. okay, because it advantages the U.S. manufacturers relative to China. Right. So from a political point of view, I would not be surprised if we don't get to a carbon tax mm -hmm. within a couple of years. Oh, yeah. My, my point is not against the carbon tax. My point is we have standards that are being set and companies that are going crazy now trying to um, uh, comply with them 
and um, but it could get us to the wrong solution because we're measuring the wrong. Even if we measured it correctly, we're measuring the wrong thing. Is well, what yeah, I'm and to. just measuring it and disclosing it does not create an incentive exactly. to reduce it. Exactly. Can I exactly. make one yeah. or two points? Yeah. Um, I'm not, notwithstanding my background, I'm not the expert on the SEC uh, climate disclosure rule, although I did, I did look at it, and I just had a couple of comments on what you said. Um, I was taken, uh, as you obviously were, by the fact that you have to report scope one, scope two, scope three, with no netting for carbon credits. I actually think that was appropriate because, as I said earlier, the credits are not, you're not buying your way out of your emissions, right? So you should be showing, to the extent this kind of disclosure is important to have, you should be showing what your <clears throat> emissions are. Um, and, and that's what you should be trying to reduce to the full extent possible. So. You said, well, companies may sort of feel guilty or whatever. I mean, the purpose of the of the credits are to say, I've done as much as I can, but to get to that last mile, I want to do more. I want to help us get to net zero that much faster by also investing in credits. The other thing I'd like to say that you didn't mention, but it, it does come up as well. There is, oh, I think you said there is disclosure of the credits. There, I was a little bit worried about unintended consequences because this will be the first time that there's a disclosure requirement for credits. There was no disclosure requirement for the quality of the credit or how you determined the quality of the credit. And I was very worried about unintended consequences, that if you do have companies that are saying, well, this would be good you know, from a PR perspective to say, well, we're trying to accelerate the transition here by buying credits, and then they're buying bad credits, that would be bad. That, that would actually encourage greenwashing. So obviously I had some uh, incentive to say, obviously if you could require that either the disclosure talked about whether it was a CCP, um, you know, whether it satisfied the core carbon principles or another metric, or that you talked about how you had policies and procedures in place to do diligence on the projects or whatever. So that to me was something that I, I don't think had been uh, considered enough. So hopefully they take that comment. We'll find out in November. I guess. We'll find out. I, and, and we should start talking about that or websites as carbon washing. Right? Because now yeah. we're saying, well, it's really better than you know, it really might be. So um, Nick, why don't we uh, get back to talking a little bit about the index. And so um, how did you take into account the investment case when you were making the index? It, it definitely. So um, we designed the index to really track the liquid most tradable segment, um, starting with the compliance side of our global carbon index. Um, so there's minimum um, monthly trading volume criteria of 10 million, of which all the programs in the index are, are well above. So there's the EUA, uh, European Union allowances, UK allowances, California carbon allowances, and regional greenhouse gas initiative contracts are what really comprise the index today. Uh, we also have diversification criteria in place. As you mentioned, the EU, um, on a pure trade date, uh, trade weighted basis, would account for roughly 90% exposure. We wanted it to really be um, global in, in nature, and for that to kind of be um, felt in the in the results of the index. Um, in terms of the investment. Case, I think it's important to know that um, while, while we know the tremendous good that these programs do um, in terms of being ESG aligned and climate impact, there's also very strong reasons for investors to get involved um, purely from a um, really kind of capital growth perspective as well. Um, so looking at the Global Carbon Index, uh, since the inception of the index in mid-2014, um, the index has returned roughly 480 um, percent, and what, what that's led to is looking at historical data, the sharp ratios for global carbon compared to traditional asset classes, stocks, bonds, um, traditional commodities, real estate, on a standalone asset class basis, sharp ratios have been higher for global carbon. Of course, that could be because of the strong um, returns, and that's not necessarily going to continue into the future. Um, so what's probably 
even more notable is from the correlation perspective and really the, the risk, risk aspect, um, when you consider global carbon versus all those um, other asset classes, the daily correlation of returns um, since inception has been under 25%, which um, really suggests that by including um, carbon in a broader asset mix, investors can achieve higher uh, sharp ratios or expected returns per unit of risk. Um, so that's really the um, modern portfolio theory um, perspective. And it, it also key to note from a different kind of investment outlook is the value perspective. Um, and I just want to kind of harken back to what Bob mentioned in terms of some of the research he did, prices of 185 per ton um, being kind of where carbon potentially should be, potentially more. Um, but if, if we look at our global carbon index, as of yesterday's close, the price uh, per ton was slightly under $41. So a more value mindset-based investor could see that discrepancy of where it's trading today and where they think the price should converge through proper regulatory um, support as potentially the opportunity. And that's certainly what, what we've been hearing. So from both those perspectives, um, there's definite appeal. Yeah, I would think that this is an asset class that you would want um, um, to be in your portfolio because at the end of the day, this is going to do nothing but grow given the, you know, the environment of, you know, wanting to do something about the environment, not using those words <laughs> interchangeably. You know, I, I would just add one thing. Um, it's very similar to um, when I was at the World Bank, we created um, a what we call capital at risk note structure versus doing um, this climate mitigation via swaps. And putting it out into the capital markets, it, it increased the, very dramatically the number of uh, investors and investor types as opposed to a bilateral negotiation, which is which typically was in the swap form. And that's usually just, you know, with insurance companies, you have the rollover risk and none of that exists in the capital market structure. But um, that was one of the big selling points that we made too to the investors. It's totally uncorrelated asset. You know, an earthquake or a cyclone or a typhoon is not correlated with any financial asset. So I, I understand that we have a question. Yeah, we have a question from an online viewer um, saying that, asking, could you talk about the regressivity of carbon market regimes versus a tax on carbon recycled into the economy through payments, programs for the poor, et cetera? Uh, I, I'm not sure we all heard the question yeah, exactly. Just, yeah. We can't really hear that. Yeah, question. absolutely. Um, the question was, could you talk about the regressivity of carbon market regimes versus a tax on carbon recycled into the economy through payments, programs for the poor, et cetera? Oh, okay. Well, uh, many people have said, and you know, uh, carbon tax is regressive. Poor people spend a lot more of their energy, uh, of their income on energy than, than rich people. But, you know, I, I chair the Climate Leadership Council. We came up with a proposal where you have a carbon dividend. So you tax everyone, but then you take the revenues and you distribute it on a per capita basis. If you do that, it becomes very progressive. So I would say a carbon tax is not necessarily regressive. It's a question of how it's implemented. Now, with respect to the, what we're talking about here and the flows of investments into natural capital, as discussed before, that's really uh, coming from developed countries and primarily going into developing countries. And so it's very, uh, I would call it a just energy transition. And, and as was discussed before, these countries did not cause the problem. They haven't benefited from the emissions of all this carbon. They've been very low carbon, actually, historically, because they've been poor. And so they're hitting there, and because they're poor, they're getting impacted much more than the wealthy. Yeah. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's a big problem. And yes, the development of this market would be very much a part of the addressing both sides of that problem. Yeah, and, and I know we have referred to it several times here, but it is pretty impressive that 90% of the demand for carbon credits is in the global north, and 90% of the nature-based solutions are in the global south. So that tells you you know, just how impactful. Yeah, it's very powerful. And um, and so I'm, I'm glad somebody raised that question because frankly, that's what I had thought before I really got involved in this space since I learned a lot about it. And then I did read about, you know, 
the alternative of you know redistributing it. Uh, but of course, you know this whole part about um, the mitigation south north to south, um, it's actually you know very much even leveling out, if not helping, in terms of uh, the playing field. So um, Nick, can I ask one other follow-up question on on the uh, the index? So where do you see green growth impacting the index? De definitely, and um, so. I think um, really what we, we definitely see continued growth in, in the space. So as of 2020, there were 31 ETS uh, program regimes um, in the market. Um, and we were, we've got our eye on definitely different markets that seem to be uh, maturing for potential um, index inclusion. So besides um, Europe, uh, the US and Canada, um, South Korea um, has a quite advanced program. New Zealand, um, China is really developing their ETS program, which once up and running will be the largest such uh, program in the world. Um, so we're really expecting um, growth in the space and are kind of positioning ourselves accordingly. Um, but I, I think it's also important to know that with the growth of the market, um, from a market uh, structure perspective, there's really been a, um, a strengthening in the, the price mechanism that comes from transparency and deeper liquidity. And that's one of the key benefits from having um, futures, which brings transparent pricing, which means that um, it'll really draw broader participation um, in the space. And altogether, this works to strengthen these important um, mechanisms that impact emitters' behavior. Um, and just to, um, as, as an example, there, there's an increased practice of shadow carbon pricing even, where different companies will use their own internal theoretical measure of the price of, of carbon. Um, for instance, BP is using an internal price of around $100 per ton, which they use to kind of assess new investment projects um, and just their, their business model in general. And having these real mechanisms and the expectations of these mechanisms in place through um, ETS systems and taxation, it shows um, through how they now kind of plan um, what their, their investments, the impact on behavior. I'm not quite sure I understand. So go back to, the, to this um, on the shadow pricing. So what exactly are they doing? Um, for, for basically internal evaluation purposes, if they're looking at a new investment, um, ah. they actually will consider um, not just necessarily the price that they would face in the marketplace, but they're using an internal estimate of where they expect the price per ton to okay. be. Okay. Um, to basically evaluate that yeah, that makes, especially if you can't totally rely on the market because the prices are all over the place, as we mentioned. Yeah. But I, I think it shows the expectation of kind of continued growth in yep. the space and that firms need to be ready yep. um, for these um, kind of forces to uh, add a cost for that negative externality. Right. So, you know, um, when Nick just mentioned, you know, all these other different countries, it, it kind of got to me to thinking, well, we're talking about quality and some. Let's face it, some countries have more higher quality standards than other countries. So Annette, how are you going to incorporate all of the different, you know, the um, countries in terms of the high quality standards? So clearly you're coming up, but as with a lot of the standards we all know, whether it's financial or otherwise, they're typically driven out of the US and Europe and not other countries or have the same, you know, levels of standards or, you know, um, perspectives, and so how are you going to um, push this into, or nudge, I guess we should call it. Well, again, I, hope, I think we're hoping for, you know, very robust adoption, mm -hmm. and with the transparency around who is investing in those CCP mm -hmm. eligible projects, hopefully there'll be more of a flight to quality. We, we know, I'm for, for sure, there are always going to be those whatever we used to call them, offshore centers or whatever, there'll be some places that, that uh, don't adopt them. But I think the, the major jurisdictions are very supportive of, of having a regime like this. So I'm hoping again that um, 
the demand that we're seeing from the corporate side who are looking for that kind of certainty around the quality of products that that will that will drive uh, adoption yeah well I'm encouraged um, thank you for that I'm encouraged that I asked was involved yeah. so that's that's really good so you've got you know at least all the regulators are involved yes and yeah and you know I I don't want to imply that the regulators are in any way endorsing but right. I um, yeah. um, and in fact they to some extent as you know they don't have you know direct jurisdiction over this now but I think it's important to have them involved again because of the adjacencies I talked about, uh, but also because you know to the extent that eventually in a perfect world they do get authority over these products, I would like to know early whether or not what we're adopting would suit them, or if there are uh, some modifications we could make that would make it better from their perspective. That makes sense. So. Um, Bob, before we wrap up, I would love to hear um, your insights, if you could share it with us, on some of the work that you're doing at the CFTC as the chairman of the Climate-Related Market Risk Subcommittee. <laughs> okay, well, uh, that subcommittee wrapped up in yeah. June of 2021, so right. uh, we, we issued a report, but what I would say is, uh, and, and you know, this is very consistent with what Annette was saying, is that the CFTC is moving forward, the mm -hmm. CF uh, the SEC is moving forward, the Fed is moving forward, the Fed joined the NGFS. Many of the uh, uh, recommendations that we made, in fact, I don't know of any recommendation we made other than putting a price on carbon, we said was the most urgent. They didn't do it? Well, <laughs> they, 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 don't have the the, they don't have the authority. <laughs> so we, we directed that toward Congress, and I would say that's in the queue, but hasn't mm -hmm. quite, but, but I'm very comfortable with the U.S. regulators, financial regulators, and what they're doing, and they, they, there's more to be done. Uh, but uh, in the report, we really said, you know, FSOC, Financial Stability yeah. Oversight Council, is the overarching yep. uh, authority here, and uh, Secretary Yellen has been terrific. Uh, the FSOC itself has uh, is in the process of instituting an advisory risk committee, and so when that's in place, that'll help and. Uh, yeah, I, I feel very comfortable about the, the direction. And and so, um, thank you. But what about the, I guess in June, I thought I saw that, um, and I realize it's not part of the committee that you were, subcommittee, but they, uh, CFTC um, launched a, um, an RFI, and yes. they want to see, you know, in terms of the, um, I guess, the impact on the financial markets. Yeah, well, uh, Chairman Russ Benham that Annette mentioned has been terrific all along. He, he created that, uh, and the, he sponsors the market risk, or he did as a commissioner, the market risk subcommittee that then, or the market risk advisory committee, which created a climate-related market risk subcommittee. So he was very involved in that, and his uh, chief of staff, David Gillers, uh, was really my right-hand man in creating that report. He did a terrific job, and he's now in charge of the climate-related oversight of the CFTC. So they're both moving forward, uh, and I wish them the best of luck. Okay, well, yes. I guess we're supposed to be ending right now. So um, thank you so much. Um, so any last comments, words of wisdom that you want to uh, share here? I just thank you for this opportunity and for getting us together, and uh, I've learned a lot from here from other panels as, as have well. I. This has been great. So uh, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, thank you everybody for uh, joining online and uh, also in person here. So we have a, um, a panel coming up next, and so um, thank you, and we shall be in touch. Thank you. Great.